next on this edition of History Center. November 22nd, 1963. Three shots. Eight seconds. Witnesses said they saw blood streaming from his head. And 39 years of the ultimate conspiracy in American history. Maybe. Lone gunman? Or sinister plot? Questions remain. Why was Kennedy riding in an open motorcade? How did Oswald get the job at the Texas School Book Depository? And if Oswald was indeed the gunman, then why didn't he take his shot sooner when the president's motorcade was in full view as seen here in this government reenactment of the assassination? There are as many conspiracy theorists as there are theories. Author journalist Gus Russo believes Oswald was indeed the trigger man, but was part of a much larger conspiracy involving Cuba's Fidel Castro. David Lifton believes Oswald was innocent and suggests a much deeper conspiracy perpetrated by high-ranking government officials, possibly including Lyndon Johnson. But for many, Gerald Posner's case closed is the final word on the JFK assassination, methodically dismantling each of the more plausible theories, pointing the finger at just one man, Lee Harvey Oswald. Three shots, eight seconds and 39 years of the ultimate conspiracy in American history. Maybe. That's next on this special edition of History Center. Welcome to History Center. I'm Steve Gillen. Joining me here in the studio today are three of the leading authorities on the Kennedy assassination, Gus Russo, David Lifton, and Gerald Posner. These gentlemen have written extensively about the assassination, but they have never appeared together to debate the assassination, and that's what's going to take place today. We also have in front of us a replica of the alleged weapon that Lee Harvey Oswald used to assassinate John F. Kennedy, if you believe Lee Harvey Oswald actually assassinated Kennedy. This is what I want to do in this first segment. Since you have very different views of the Kennedy assassination, I want to give each of you 90 seconds to explain your position. And then we're going to come back and give you each the opportunity to question one another. So, Gus, why don't you go first? You have 90 sure. seconds. What is your position? Who shot John F. Kennedy and why? Well, my position, based on the many years of research that I did for my book, I came to the conclusion that uh, Oswald indeed shot the president, that uh, there was no evidence of a conspiracy in Dealey Plaza itself. The Warren Commission got that right. Uh, what I found was most fascinating, though, the deeper I got into the new documentation that's, that's come out over the years, is that the Warren Commission was uh, in, um, insulated from a lot of information that they should have known about that would have caused them to see if Oswald was a hired gun, uh, specifically foreign policy information, which was kept from the Warren Commission, uh, information that would uh, uh, talk about Cuba because Oswald was pro-Castro, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion. In the Warren Commission's opinion, he was pro-Castro. Nonetheless, they had no motive why a pro-Castro guy would shoot President Kennedy. Well, had they had known what was going on vis-a-vis -vis Washington and Cuba, they might have had a motive. They could have looked for a motive. And a, a lot of things were kept from the Warren Commission about Oswald's travels, who he was in touch with. The CIA knew these things. We know this now from their documentation, that when Oswald went to Mexico City, uh, the CIA was informed that there were dangerous people he was meeting in the Cuban embassy and outside of the Cuban embassy, and these things were not passed on. So the commission was sort of flailing about for a motive, and they could never put it together. Okay, thank you. David Lifton, you have 90 seconds. Well, to begin with, I do not believe Oswald shot President Kennedy. I believe he's totally innocent to the shooting. The reason he appears to have shot President Kennedy is the, is, is the result of falsified evidence. Basically, the body of the president was altered. There's a false autopsy here which falsely links the gun found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, the replica, of, the replica of the gun, and there's three shells up there and all the rest of it, to the crime that takes place in the street below. Absent the falsification of that autopsy, um, absent, uh, because of that falsification of the autopsy, is that he appears to be the uh, president's assassin. But let me tell you something about Oswald. Uh, you have to know a few things about him. He's, first of all, a phony red. He's a phony Marxist. He uh, joined the Marines at 16 uh, and 19, excuse me, at 17 in October 56 when they're putting down the Hungarian Revolution. He did not join the Marines to make the world safe for socialism. Um, 
His heroes were John Wayne. His uh, authors he loved were Jack London and Ernest Hemingway. His travels have a lot to do with his desire to become a writer. And so he's an excellent poseur. He has all the theatrical skills of a great undercover agent. And when he was in Russia, as my new book, Final Charade, will show, he was definitely on assignment for the Central Intelligence Agency. He has a mission in Russia, but he also has a personal agenda, an adventurous agenda for going there. When he returned from Russia, he was uh, approached by people who recruited him into what he thought was a legitimate covert operation. Uh, and he had to, was told to c keep pretending he was a red. He did a lot of things that these guys take seriously as evidence and which provide their so-called motivation. And on November 22nd, with this mail order rifle that he was told to order, he was, through a false autopsy, implicated in the assassination. Okay, thank you. Gerald? Well, uh, you know, I'll tell you, it's very interesting li listening, especially to David, because he understands that unless he says the evidence is false, there's only one conclusion if you examine this evidence. The credible evidence here points to one thing happening, and that is that Lee Harvey Oswald, troubled as a youngster, going into the Marines to try to escape this troubled background, finding out that he thought he'd be somebody in the Marines, and instead he's thrown in the shower and called Mrs. Oswald and thought of as being gay, escapes the Marines and goes over and defects to the Soviet Union, where he thinks he'll suddenly be accepted as a hero there, and the Russians think that he's odd. The Russian files are now out. They put him out into Minsk, where he marries a Russian wife. He gets not accepted there at all. He comes back unhappy as a leftist, but also as a mix of anarchy in his new politics to the United States. He decides he's going to commit political assassination and put himself in the history books. You won't hear this from them. Where does he go? He goes and tries to shoot a retired army general, a right winger down in Texas, Edwin Walker, and he misses him by this little bit of luck where the bullet hits the windshield and just misses Walker's head. He fails at that. He goes off to New Orleans in the summer of 63, months before the assassination, starts a new organization for the support of his new hero, Fidel Castro, and doesn't get a single person to join his organization when he's out on the hot streets of New Orleans trying to get them in. He fails again. He goes down to Mexico. Mexico City where he's now going to defect over to Cuba and join the Castro Revolution and the Cubans say get lost you're too odd and he comes back to Dallas a couple of months just a month before that assassination and all of a sudden John F. Kennedy is given to him on a silver platter the man who thinks he's going in the history books because he's going to be shooting at Walker and putting himself there gets to shoot at the president of the United States he's working in the building where the president's motorcade will come by it's not a suicide mission but he pulls it off that day with the one shot then kills a policeman on his escape that's Time's Lee up. Harvey Oswald putting himself in the history books. Whew. <laughs> That's a lot of information. Well, we've heard the theories. When we come back, we're going to focus on two questions. One, Oswald's motivation, and second, his ability to pull off the assassination. We're going to have this debate for the first time on television. Stay with us. Welcome back to History Center. We're having our debate, first ever debate among leading authors about the Kennedy assassination. And there's so much here. There's so much controversy, so many things we could focus on. I want to zoom in on just two critical issues. The first is, what were Oswald's motivation for shooting Kennedy? And secondly, did he have the ability to pull off the assassination? Now, David, you don't believe Oswald shot Kennedy, so the issue of motivation for you is irrelevant. Correct. The issue is, is irrelevant to my standpoint. It's, it's what is the psychology, and was he involved as a secret agent when he went to Russia? Is he, is he a pretender? And when he went to Russia, there's a number of things that indicate that he was a pretender. For the first, first of all, he was a lover of John Wayne. He joins the Marines, and he's supposedly a socialist. He's joining the Marines at the same time that there's the Hungarian Revolution. He didn't join the Marines to make the world safe for socialism. When he's over there in Russia, he writes a manuscript. He refers to Castro as a fellow traveler on the way back on the boat, he talks about, he says, when they had convinced themselves that I was the naive American who believed in communism, they let me stay. So to me, this is all indications that he's a phony Marxist. Phony Marxist? Boy, I'll tell you, David, if the evidence of him being a phony Marxist is he like John Wayne, you haven't convinced me. I mean, this is somebody who I think was really committed not only to the left, he was committed to it, but in my view of Oswald, he also had a bit of uh, sort of anarchy built into his political philosophy. The Lee Harvey Oswald that I came to understand from my study of him was somebody who was capable of being on the sixth floor of a building in downtown Dallas shooting at the President of the United States in November of 63, or could have been on the sixth floor of a building in Moscow shooting at Nikita Khrushchev. He was ready to throw a cog into the machine of government and he was standing up to everybody that had abused him in the past who had fired him from jobs from arena who ridiculed him who those who thought he wasn't smart enough to say i am somebody i'm sure. able to kill the president of the united twice, states twice he had kids uh, in february in 62 and in, in november in 63 and each time he told marina he wanted it to be a boy because he wanted his child to be grow up to be president of the united states some marxist right he wouldn't have he, killed so his is own he, is child he a phony marxist no he's a real i think he's a real marxist but it's it's he also had some mental instability going on with this guy and i know 
Fitzgerald, you know, has that in, in, in your work, and I believe that to a degree. The guy, you know, he glommed on to Marxism without, I don't think, understanding it in any great depth. He wanted to belong to something. But I think one consistent theme in his life was Fidel Castro. From the time he joined the Marines at 16 or 17, whatever, he talked about Castro's revolution. A lot of Americans, a lot of liberals, a lot of lefties, you know, latched on to this idea, this romantic revolution. O Oswald stayed with it. After he came back from Russia, he joined the Fair Play, tried to join the Fair Play for Cuba committee. He hands out Viva Fidel pamphlets. He has an argument with his wife. If they, ha if they were going to have a, a baby boy, he was going to name it Fidel. She didn't want that. So let me, let me make sure I understand the positions. You believe that Oswald was, had no motivation to shoot Kennedy. Red, white, and blue American. Red, white, and blue American. You believe he's actually pro-Cuban, pro -Cuban. but you think he's a nut. Yeah, uh, no, I, not, no, not is, is too easy to say about him. Okay. I think he was just certainly unstable, and it's one of the reasons I believe he was so unstable that no intelligence agency would use him. Even the Cubans and the Russians were too smart not to use him. And those files are now out. We now know from the intelligence people that they thought there was something strange about him. The United States wouldn't use him. It was that instability that ran through his life. And David, of course he might want his uh, child to grow up to become the president of the United States. What good Marxist wouldn't to change the system and overthrow it if that's the case? Well, but it doesn't mean he didn't shoot the president. Hinckley was a red, white, and blue American and still shot at Reagan, so it doesn't mean anything to me. But in the end, when you examine him, this is what's critical to me. I agree with Gus Russo in the sense that Oswald was the shooter. I disagree with you about the extent to which you think he was involved with the Cubans. My problem with David's work is that David realizes that if you accept the evidence that I look at, which is the straightforward evidence, the conclusion is that Oswald is the shooter. And that's why in the end I think there are so many things you don't agree with. You think the autopsy was faked, that's right. they, that the autopsy pictures were faked, right? that the x-rays were faked. Not what about the Zapruder film? Is the Zapruder film faked? Well, I'm partial to that, but that's not the subject of my current work. My work is on Oswald right, and his because psychology. because the Zapruder film, of course, shows no. that somebody was what shooting is, him from behind. What is Oswald's best friend doing do corresponding with, with the White House in the spring of 1963? I mean, something is going on here when you have Oswald very close. His best friend is George DeMore and Shield, and you've got letters between DeMore and Shield and the White House Wait, in the spring of 63. George, George very Shield, what did George DeMore and Shield, Oswald's best friend, uh, what did Oswald and DeMore and Shield talk about uh, the month before the assassination? The month before this, right. no, no, they, well, they weren't in Haiti. associated with each no, other. But they had DeMar Shield already left Oswald's absolutely, life? Absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> I missed that. Absolutely. Let's, about talk, about, let's talk about let's talk about his ability to execute the assassination. Sure. You mentioned the Zabruder film. The Zabruder film documents the Kennedy assassination. Now, one of the key components of the Warren Commission is the, the theory of the magic bullet. Now, Gerald, can you explain for us? We have we have the weapon here, the supposed weapon that Lee or Harvey Oswald used and a facsimile of the of the bullet itself. Tell me what the magic bullet was and why it's important. Let me tell you, I think this is absolutely critical. If somebody is shooting, if you want to say it's Oswald or wherever else, and I think it's Oswald, shooting the president from behind that day, and I think the Zapruder film shows that the only shots that hit the president and Connolly came from behind. One of the theories that the Warren Commission had was that one bullet happened to pierce the high rear neck portion of the president went on to hit the governor at the same time and came out in relatively good condition, just slightly flattened. That was called the so-called magic bullet. They couldn't prove it at the time. They guessed at it. They worked back into that, as a matter of fact. Specter did, the senator from Pennsylvania. Today you can prove that that happened. And as a matter of fact, this is what the bullet looked like. This is the fully jacketed metal bullet, the 6.5 millimeter shell. That's not the, that's not the shell. It's just the bullet itself. This is what went through the president that day. That's what hit him in the back of the head. This is a 165 grain bullet. It's a heavy bullet. And if you think that Oswald is not capable of carrying out the assassination or anybody else back there, this is the 9138 Mandelker Carcano. The only difference from Oswald's is it's a little bit longer on the stock. And as Marina used to describe, he used to sit in New Orleans and all night long operate this bolt, just like this. And anybody who thinks that the bolt's difficult to operate, ask any of you to operate it. You can it's, operate in a matter of a fraction of a second. Oswald was a marksman in the Marines. He took three shots that day, and only one does the <laughs> trick, catches Kennedy in the high rear portion of the head, an inch and a half higher, Oswald misses. We now know from Hinckley, an inch over Reagan's dead. That's the difference between these assassinations being successful or not. So three bullets in how many seconds? About eight, 8.2 seconds. You accept that? I agree. You accept. Yeah. Yeah, Oswald shot, using a weapon like this, shot three bullets, there was a magic bullet. And the evidence he, is overwhelming, I think. David? The story of Oswald and the three shots that these guys believe in is Goldilocks and the three bears. <laughs> he believes in a conspiracy of four bears, okay? <laughs> but other than that, this thing is a total but, wait, fraud wait, wait, based on a why. false autopsy why. because the body in President Kennedy in Dallas, Texas, according to the original okay. medical documents, was shot from the front. By the time it gets to Bethesda in a body bag and with head surgery, yes, it looked like it was here's, 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 here's the question I have. If we're sitting around planning the assassination beforehand, we say, let's get rid of that no good president. We're going to get rid of him. Right. We're going to 
frame this guy Oswald, right. who's such a patsy, he's a dope. He's we'll not pretend, a dope, no, but okay. we'll pretend that somebody's shooting from behind. Correct. And we'll grab the president's body, we'll steal it, we'll, we'll take the brain out, we'll fake the autopsy, we'll fake the photographs, we'll do the x-rays, we'll fake the Zapruder film and all of this. I would say to you, why go through all of that? Hundreds of conspirators possibly could unravel. Why don't we just put the world-class assassin, instead of on the grassy knoll, put him behind the president. Let's shoot the president from the or rear Jeremy. so that because the real have, evidence is no, there. No, That's the simpler thing then you do. Have overlap. No, no, you can't shoot the president with a $12 rifle. And as you know from your writings done. about <laughs> unintended consequences is, is that they plan to shoot the president in a certain way and get those bullets out immediately. It did not happen. And there was a botched operation to alter that okay. body well, before it got I'll to tell the president. what I want to do. We have a film that the Secret Service took, a reenactment of what Oswald saw from the sixth floor of the depository building. I want to look at this film, and I want you to watch this. Now, this is what Lee Harvey Oswald would have seen. Now, the question I have for Gus and Gerald, why doesn't Oswald shoot now? I mean, wait, he's right in front of him. Oswald, he's well, right, the attendee right, yeah. is coming right well, toward him. Question. Now, he waits. Well, he waits. Let me finish. He yeah. waits until the car turns, and... He fires the shots now as the car is moving away. Why doesn't he shoot? Because, but you, have to be, you have to be standing in the sixth floor of the depository to right. understand this. And what happens if as Oswald takes the first shot as the car is coming toward him, and what we just saw in the film, he's completely exposed to the buildings to the left of him, which are as high as the Dallas School Book Depository. Yeah, yeah. Everybody hanging out the window looking at the motorcade that day immediately sees the assassin in the middle of the window looking and firing down at the car. This is not a suicide mission. This is a man who wanted to get away. He has a chance of getting away if all they see out the window is just the barrel of the gun. Only a few witnesses see him. He does escape from Dean Plaza, and if I he doesn't run by, the yeah, car, all the away. faces were facing Oswald. If, if he'd have taken the shot, then what he waited, what he did was he had set up his perch with these boxes on the windowsill, faced long range downwind down the uh, the hill, away from when the when the viewers were all had their backs to the depository. He had pre-planned to shoot that way. Had he a shot Kennedy earlier, when he had to come out of his nest. And, but he had prepared that way. But David, so. for you, that film seems, supports, you think, Correct. That is one, one of the many case. implausibilities connected with this case, and it's always been inexplicable to me why Oswald wouldn't just fire one shot when he was so close. You don't find, you don't find, I explain that to you. I don't find, you still don't Right, no, I don't find it a convincing explanation, no. Okay, I'll tell you, we're going to take a break. You mentioned the autopsy. When we come back, we're going to talk about the, the autopsy that took place after Kennedy was assassinated. Stay with us. We'll be right Welcome back to History Center. David, you left off. You were telling us about the autopsy and why yes. you, you believe the autopsy was falsified. Correct. The FBI reported when the body arrived, it was, quote, apparent that there had been surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull. Both FBI agents were deposed by the Assassination Records and Review Board in the mid-1990s. Both stood behind their report. Neither backed off. The staff member handling the whole area for the ARRB, Doug Horn, said best evidence in the thesis it proposes is much stronger after our investigation. Here's the evidence. First of all, the FBI said there was surgery of the head area based on what the doctor said. Second of all, when you compare Dallas records with Bethesda, there's a four to five hundred percent increase in the size of the fatal wound. And, set, and thirdly, the body arrived in a body okay. bag. It left Dallas. And the reason in a why that's coffin. important is it was falsified to make it look, look as like if a lone was shot. Lee Harvey Oswald well, acted alone. Shot from behind. You shot from behind. You believe you shot from front. front. You know, I must tell you, t uh, we never accept in this country almost what FBI agents say if they observe something right in front of them. Now we have two FBI agents who aren't even doctors, and we're suddenly accepting what they say about surgery. But here's the great thing, and David Lifton's theory, which I, I totally disagree with, as he knows, Mrs. Kennedy essentially has to be part of the conspiracy, Jackie Kennedy, because she's the one who's asked on the plane, returning right. with, where do you want to have the president's autopsy done? And she says Bethesda because Jack was a naval man. Now, if you believe that there was a team of conspirators ready to come in and they were ready to fake the surgery and pretend that he was really shot from the back when he was shot from the front, they would have to have conspirator doctors at all of the area hospitals no, no, where she could true. have chosen to take him. No. And so essentially now we have hundreds of people on stand well, ready she, to go no, in and fake no, 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 no. And, and, and the Navy hospital is Jack's hospital. But she the it. Army hospital was Truman's hospital. Yeah. Also, and, the, and, and radio communications show that body's going to Bethesda, period. Oh, no, but she um, made so that It's a pro forma choice. Guys, David, as you also know, there are witnesses to the autopsy who say that Jack Kennedy wasn't brought in in a body bag. You have some that say he was. That's right. You, Why you, are there you, any you know, that say he was? Well, people make mistakes. Why are there any that say he was? You choose to believe the ones you want to believe. If I take two conflicting pieces of evidence, there's a car wreck, and somebody says the car was red, somebody else says green, I know they both can't be right, so I will weigh them, look at other evidence, and decide which one's right. 
what you do in your book, you're a prodigious researcher, and you do come up with these conflicting stories. And instead of saying which one's right, I'll determine one's wrong, you say they mo both must be right, and therefore you back into a theory that supports no, no, both, it and the theory way. just Sorry, is too far afield. There is not a single Dallas doctor in the original me medical records. I don't think there's a single doctor who says President Kennedy shot from behind. They, they never turned him about, over. They, they never, never turned him over. The back wounded, because so they never they turned him over. Stories they, the because, Secret Service. Is that they were trying to save his life. I don't believe it's because they never turned him over. That's the official but government version. But did they turn version. him over? But did they, did they, they turn no, him over? No, they did not turn him over. No, they were trying to save his life, not to turn him over. No, they see an exit wound in the back of the head. If we're going to focus on the wound that killed President Kennedy, how could they see an exit wound in the back of the head when they never turned him over? Because you could see the back of the head. In fact, they had X-ray vision. And Bethesda, there's a five. There's a huge hole at the top of the head which is not seen in Dallas. That's the most important thing to know. In fact, one nurse goes in there and says, "I had to ask parents." That's why. I'll explain that. I'll explain that. That huge hole at the top of the head. Top of the head is not only in Dallas. I'll tell you where it is. It's on the Zapruder film, which is maybe why you say it's fake because you know the evidence is there. If you stop the frame and you, anybody can go out and buy the DVD of the Zapruder film nowadays and stop it at the moment that exit wound takes place, the entire right front top portion of the president's head blows But the, other, the logical problem with all this is, David, I've never heard you say when this body alteration could have, you know, physically happened. There's no time. Oh, there's plenty of time. No, no, no. no. The body has to be gotten out of, we are dealing, then we get into a whole other area of why Johnson question. delayed the flight uh, and said, I have to be sworn in, Bobby told me, and Bobby denies that he told him any such thing. But this is the I'm delay saying, of the flight in Dallas listen when all this hanky-panky starts. But listen to how, but listen how complex this is, and that's why I say, let's put the common sense hat on here. Wouldn't you say, if you were the conspirators, you're about to pull off the perfect crime, the president of the United States is about to be murdered, you want to frame this guy for shooting behind, instead of going through all of this that could unravel at any point, wouldn't you just put an assassin behind the president and shoot him from there? I got no, a better one. Why, why couldn't it. you just take the, the Oswald rifle and plant it in front where your shooter is? They you find can't have the <laughs> rifle that's going to be the frame-up rifle. Uh, you can't have that in the same place where you have the real assassins no, the for a number of reasons. The reason he says that is because he knows he doesn't have a book if he does no, that. No, no, no. <laughs> the reason I say that is logically it doesn't work. You Unfortunately, we're out of time in this segment. When we come back, I have a question for you, and that is, if you're right, why do about 90% of the American public believe conspiracy theories like the one proposed by David Lipton? So we're going to take a break, we're going to go back and get an answer to that question. Stay with us. Welcome back to History Center. Gerald, what's the answer to the question? Why do people believe David if you're so right? Well, I think, first of all, because they've heard all these questions over the years about the assassination, the single bullet couldn't have happened, these mystery witnesses were killed over time. We don't trust our government. We've come out to believe it. They've read too many books like David's. They've seen the Oliver Stone film. They haven't read Case Closed. And in the end, we want to believe in some ways that this great charismatic president, John Kennedy, he couldn't have been taken down by a 23-year-old, just turned 24-year-old sociopath, Lee Harvey Oswald, with, as David always says, a $12 rifle. But sometimes the answers in history are actually that simple. In this case, much to people's disappointment, if they actually study the case, they'll find out that is the answer of what happened. That here. has to be the last word. Gentlemen, this is a great discussion. I learned a lot. We're going to have you all back. We're going to do this again. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.